great. Uh, dobar dan i hvala. That is all I have managed to learn in Croatian, but uh, thank you very much for inviting me here to speak today. It's a pleasure to be here, and I understand that most of the people in the room are more researchers and from the academic side of things than necessarily from the identity providing side. So I'll try to keep this talk focused on what it is that we as researchers and research communities are doing in identity management. If I talk too fast, please wave, because I'm, I'm English, I know I have a tendency to speed up as I get overexcited, and this topic is one where I particularly have that tendency, so just let me know. So I'm going to be talking about federated identity management for research, and the message I want you to take away at the end of this is that the key to getting federated identity management to work for our researchers is collaboration. As a research community, as CERN, we cannot do it alone. We need the help of all different stakeholders in this ecosystem. And we'll come on to the details of what that actually means over the next 40, 45 minutes. So I, I work at CERN. I work on the authentication and authorization systems. And I also work with the researchers to try and improve their digital security and how they're accessing the computing that they need for their, for their analyses. I also work on the ARC project, um, which is a project funded by the European Commission for authentication and authorization for research and collaboration. And I have a couple of slides on what that is and why it's useful for CERN and hopefully for, for other communities who may be in this room. So my job, in a sentence, is making digital life for researchers more secure. And for me, the aspects that I really focus on is not so much the protocol side of security, but the people side. It's the people who introduce the majority of the risk in our scenarios. It's how people manage their identities. And that is the aspect of security where I think we have a long way to go, but uh, it's a very hopeful field and somewhere where we can really make a difference and keep our infrastructure secure. I'm based at CERN, but I do spend most of my time traveling around the world, working with other people who are doing my job in different research communities. So particularly this gang of people on the right here, who are collectively known as the FIM4R community, so Federated Identity Management for Research. I want to start by putting it in context, and I like stories, so I'm going to take us back to the early 2000s. So this is the Large Hadron Collider, and it's the particle accelerator that is 100 meters underground in Geneva, well, crossing the border between Geneva and France. It's almost 27 kilometers round, and at the time, it was one of the biggest experiments and engineering projects in the world. I believe it still is, though maybe some other things have now um, passed that particular milestone. So the plan in the early 2000s was to construct this accelerator and to accelerate particles around it so that they would collide in detectors. And there would be four detectors around the accelerator. Every time particles collided, they would produce data. And that data would be sent to the data center, which was physically located in CERN in, in Switzerland for the data to be, to be stored, to be processed, and to be made available to the researchers. So I remember when I was, was studying, um, I, I did astrophysics, as, as was said just now. It, I got to a point where I had too much data and too much code to run it on my own machine. So of course, I then needed to use one of these shared infrastructures. And that is certainly the case with the physics that we're doing at CERN. The data sets are enormous. There is not a possibility for the scientists that we have to do it on their physical, on their local machine. And so sending out what we call jobs to the computing infrastructure is, is a fundamental part of actually getting that research to the stage of publication. So they did some calculations of how much data would be generated by these four detectors around the Large Hadron Collider and realized that they had a problem. So it's a... That's a pretty basic equation that we have here, supply and demand. And they realized that demand, so the amount of computing that was needed just to process and store the data coming from the experiments, 
far exceeded what was actually possible at CERN. And unfortunately, I mean, I'm sure you're all aware how it is. In research, we do not have unlimited resources. We cannot just extend the data center, buy a bunch more computers, and make this work. So they had to think a little bit outside the box. And what they did was look to collaboration. So collaboration was already something that we know works for research. It works for the researchers themselves who come from all over the world to collaborate together to produce publications and science. And so they had the same model with computing. So this, um, the picture that we have here, it's a little blurry, but I think it gives the idea. So in total, there are now 170 different data centers around the world who are participating to produce that supply of compute that was required for the demand generated by the experiments. It's a great model. Uh, it was called the grid. I imagine probably there are people in here who have used it, have heard of it. Um, and at the time, this was the best model. So commercial clouds uh, were not suitable in terms of price, in terms of maturity. And looking within the research community for a solution was definitely the, the best option. I'll come on to how that's maybe evolving or has evolved towards the end of the presentation. So we have a situation here where we have uh, 170 different organizations contributing computing power based in 42 countries. Each country maybe have their own rules, their own culture, their different ways of working. And on top of that, we have about 15,000 scientists. This is a very basic plot. But to give you the idea, the amount of data as that goes up, the number of participants required to provide the computing also goes up. As I alluded to, maybe these days that's not really the model, as we have different um, heterogeneous sources of computing that we can be using. But this was certainly the model at the time in the early 2000s. So data increased, participants increased at the same time. And we see this as well in, in other research domains. So the statistics that I've pulled out here came from a paper that was published last summer by that group of people on the first slide, the fim 4 r community. So pulling out the information about the number of users, the number of participating countries, and the number of participating computing sites. And it's not a direct correlation, but roughly this is the model that we have. So why am I stressing this so much? This is the challenge. So we have a large global user community, and they're working on a distributed infrastructure. They don't necessarily know each other. There may be pockets there that do, and they don't necessarily ever meet. There might not be a point where it's logical for people to go to register, to have a local account provisioned, whatever that might be, whatever this community aspect of the physical location. So the challenge is provisioning identities and how can we securely provision digital identities for those researchers who need to access that grid to do their computing that no longer works on their local laptop. So I have a question for you. I'm hoping you're, you're feeling up for some audience participation before lunch. So who knows the user best? Um, I'll go through the options and then ask you to raise your hands as we go through them once more. So who knows the user best? I'm thinking about who has really a relationship with the user, who knows maybe their address, their name, who would know if their name changes, for example. Is it the research community? Is it the infrastructure? Is it the home organization? Or is it nobody? So OK, we'll go through again. Option A. Option B, option C, or option D. I'm hoping no one puts their hand up. <laughs> OK, great. So this was actually um, the crux of it, really. So yes, the home organization is the one who knows the person. They have probably a contract with them. Or if not, they have a very close relationship with them. If that person changes, then they would know about it. Effectively, it's follow the money. No? They're paying the salary of this person in the majority of cases. They have that close relationship. 
Next question. Who knows what they are working on? So A, the research community. B, the infrastructure. C, the home organization. Or D, nobody. Please don't say nobody. <laughs> Although it might be true. <laughs> OK, so A, the research community. B, the infrastructure. C, the home organization. Or D. <laughs> so yeah, I think you all naturally understood this, being in the research domain. Of course, the home organization doesn't know what somebody is doing in the context of the research community. And it's the research community themselves who knows the structure of the teams, knows what authorization a researcher would need to be able to actually do their job. If a researcher can't do it, they'll go back to the research community and make sure that they can. So we have a separation here between authentication and authorization. So for authentication, we want that to be done by the party that knows the person. And for authorization, we want it to be done by the party who knows what they're doing. So this leads to effectively a distributed authentication and authorization model that we have. So this is my researcher in the middle trying to access the infrastructure with authentication from the trusted identity provider and authorization from the research community. How did we do this in the 2000s? So going back to the beginning of our story, in the 2000s, there was only one real option for doing this um, that was heavily debated at the time and chosen eventually for at least the high energy physics community at CERN was certificates. Um, so digital certificates, normally you'd see these when you go to a website and there's the green padlock and you know that that website has been vetted, that it is a genuine website and it is not pretending to be somebody else. And effectively, what the high-energy physics community did, along with many other communities, was to give a certificate to each individual person. So the user, the researcher, would be in charge of managing this digital document and for using it when they wanted to access the infrastructure. The problem was that home organizations couldn't do this. They didn't really have the technology to do that. Um, but the, the scheme worked in terms of the infrastructure, in terms of everybody being able to authenticate. So what they did was to create a group of certificate authorities who would issue these certificates to the users and make sure that they all behaved in an appropriate way. So this group was called the IGTF, the Interoperable Global Trust Foundation, if I do not get my acronyms wrong. And they effectively had certificate authorities from each country, those 42 countries that we saw in the map earlier, agreeing to deploy their certificate authorities in the same way so that people could be sure that the users who had a certificate from the Croatian certificate authority had had their identity checked by that authority. So in a way, there was a relationship between the certificate authority and the researcher. And so in this way, we had all of the researchers with a digital document, their certificate, saying, this is who I am online. I've come with my certificate that has been issued by a trusted certificate authority. But that doesn't solve the authorization case. So then we have, so at the top we have a very basic picture of a certificate, and the bottom here we have an idea of how the authorization was added to the top. And effectively people would send their certificates to their research community who would add the authorization aspect on the top. So say this person is in this group, they have this role, send it back to the user, and then the user had both authentication and authorization in this certificate. So the trust in this model was provided by this IGTF group here, who made sure that all of the certificate authorities were working together in a way that was trustworthy. There was quite a big problem with this. So I wish I'd made this up. Um, I see this quite a lot that people really 
a, a typical researcher does not know what the certificate is. It's not part of their training in physics. And then they're told they have to suddenly manage this document that they don't really know what to do with. Browsers are becoming less supportive of certificates. It's just a bit of a pain. So people do waste a lot of their time, their research time, trying to manage these certificates for themselves. And then we get into the 2010s, maybe a little bit before this. And it's the hope that SAML, so the Security Assertion Markup Language, that SAML federations could provide a better alternative. So I understand that here in Croatia you have EduHR, and I think probably you're all familiar with using it, how it works behind the scenes, that each organization has some metadata about itself that's shared so that there is mutual trust and people are able to authenticate from an identity provider to a service provider. So where's the trust there? We have the trusted identity provider who trusts the federation, who trusts the infrastructure, who is registered as a service in the federation, and all the parties within that federation trust each other. But we're missing a piece. And this was where the difficulty came in, really. The authorization is not something that's so naturally supported by this federated model of an identity provider authenticating to a service provider. There were a few different ways to do it, um, but it didn't seem to be working out. It seemed to be too much overhead for all of the parties involved. It's already quite challenging in some circumstances to operate a service provider or an identity provider in a federation. And the authoriz authorization part wasn't working. We know that it can't be the home organization who sends the authorization to the infrastructure. It needs to be the research community. So in 2015, there was a gradual realization that the pure SAML Federation model wasn't really going to work, and that SAML Federations were really just one small piece of the puzzle, specifically that piece on the top row there. So I'll come back to this colorful diagram. You do not need to understand it right now. We'll spend a little bit more time thinking about it in a couple of minutes. So this has brought us more or less to the present, where we are today. And onto the ARC project. So this is authentication and authorization for research and collaboration. And the project was started to respond to this realization that although SAML federations were excellent at providing authentication, they didn't really cut it for the authorization part. And there are research communities like CERN, like other research communities that we have, LIGO we saw in the, in the statistics there, who want to be using it. But there are so many blocks that it doesn't seem logical for us to be putting SAML federations in the critical path to our infrastructures. If we are relying on SAML federations as the entry point for our researchers to be able to do their science, then we need to have a certain amount of confidence in the technology and in the policies. So ARC began to collate the best practices. They didn't come up with anything, but what they did was a survey of all the different research communities. So they looked at Sligo, they looked at CERN, they looked at Clarion, which is a humanities infrastructure, and they identified the best practices and tried to put it into a model. So we do need to understand a little bit about this before we move on much further, otherwise I'm going to lose you all. And it's approaching lunchtime and you're probably all lacking sugar. So, on the top row here in the purple, I'm hoping the definition's okay to be able to see it, um, but overall, that's the authentication layer. And the idea is that people will be able to authenticate to a research infrastructure through a number of identity providers. So we have, do I have a, yeah. We have the SAML federations there. Some people still want to use their certificates to be able to authenticate to things as crazy as it sounds these days. We have OpenID Connect. Have people heard of OpenID Connect? You will have seen it. So if you are an average internet user, you use Google, Facebook, uh, TripAdvisor, there's often the option to log in to something with something else. 
so maybe you log into TripAdvisor using Facebook. That protocol is OpenID Connect. Um, it has certain advantages, the main one being that it's much more simple from the development point of view. So we have social IDs here. So using the OpenID Connect protocol for people who, for whatever reason, don't have an identity provider at their home organization. Maybe they're in a country that doesn't have a national federation. Um, maybe they don't have an IT department. For whatever reason, maybe they need to be doing their science under their Google identity. EGov ID or other. So the authentication layer at the top here. And a researcher would choose one of these, log in to the central part of the authentication and authorization infrastructure, uh, which is called a proxy in this model because it, it funnels the authentication, adds the authorization into the middle, and then all of the different services where the researcher would want to go are below that proxy. So it's a, a funneling mechanism in a way. We have different attributes that may need to be added. So has somebody signed an acceptable use policy for this research community? Do they know that they're not supposed to be using this for Bitcoin, for example? which is a problem that many research communities out there face. I'm sure some of you in here have that exact issue. The authorization part, and then maybe there need to be some token translation. And then down at the bottom here, we have the different services that people might want to be using. So that could be a web portal, it could be a command line client where somebody would need to submit their, their job. So the job is the analysis code in, in the jargon that I'm used to at CERN. And this has many success stories, this, this architecture here. So I just want to talk about two. Um, so gwastronomy.org. You've probably not heard of this, but you will have heard of the result that came out of it. And this is the collaboration hub for gravitational wave astronomy. So it was used, this platform, using exactly that model of infrastructure, was used to manage the collaboration around the August 17, 2017 Kilanova event, which led to the Nobel Prize last year two years ago. So there's, there's proof that this stuff works. Researchers were able to log in from all their different countries all over the world, collaborate together, and eventually produce a Nobel Prize. Maybe this is an extreme example, um, but it does show that using something like this is not only necessary, unfortunately, to have this fairly complex infrastructure in place, to enable collaboration, but it does work. It provides an experience that users are able to manage and then able to produce their research at the end of that. The other example I want to talk about is Umbrella. And this is a group of 16 light sources. So light sources are similar to, to particle accelerators, but um, producing beams of light which can be used to probe the interior of matter. So if you wanted to study the structure of a protein, you would book time to go to a light source. You would take your sample along, you would put it at the end of the beam of light, and you could analyze that and take your data home with you. So they have a very different model where people physically go into these light source facilities. They bring their sample. They need to leave with the sample and the data at the end of it. So it's much more physical in a way. They need to be authenticated not only on the web, not only on the command line, but also to the actual machines. So they needed slightly different technology, but still the technology fell into this model that we saw before, the, the blueprint that we have for authentication and authorization. And they have a steady growth rate of about 20% users per year. So is the challenge now solved? I'm gonna have a sip of water. I think you probably know the answer is no. In my Too many rhetorical questions in these slides. Right. So no, it is not. And all of these research communities, plus a lot of others whose logos I could not find online, are of the same opinion. We have something that works, but it's not perfect. Um, there's a long way to go in terms of technology. There's a long way to go in terms of policy. And actually, we would like to make, that, make our requirements known to the wider community. When I say wider community, I mean the identity federations, I mean inter-federations, 
you've probably used Edugain if you've logged into a service that's not in Croatia using EduHR, and you would have gone through Edugain, which is the international federation. There are different participants in this distributed authentication and authorization infrastructure. And by pooling all of our collective gripes and grumbles and challenges together, this group, the FIM4R group, uh, has managed to document exactly what it is that we think we need in order to put Identity Federation in that critical path to our services. I mentioned last summer, the fim for our community published a paper. This is the paper here. It's a very nice piece of symmetry, actually. So in, in physics, we often think about symmetry. It's a very satisfying feeling. And this paper had 40 authors, uh, 40 pages, and then sadly, 41 requirements at the end of it. So uh, it would have been nice if we could cut down one of them, but no. So if you'd like to take a look, it's available online. It's open. Uh, so the idea here is that if you're in a research community and you are experiencing the same sort of things, chances are we've already captured your particular challenges and we're already petitioning the wider community to make changes to make life easier for our researchers. So do take a look if you're interested in learning a little bit more. So to go briefly through those recommendations, because up to this point it's been fairly abstract and I would like you to get an idea of what it is that we're actually asking for as research communities. So governance and sustainability. There are lots of groups out there. So REFEDS is, um, is a group where the different national federations will talk together to discuss standards, to discuss um, policies, frameworks, whatever it might be about national identity federations. There are other similar groups within countries. There are groups that span countries. We'd like research representation within those groups, just to make sure that what it is we're asking for is not lost, not pushed away into a corner and forgotten about for the next 15 years. Funding. So, I mean, that's a, an obvious one, maybe, but um, research communities, funding is often a problem. We have funding cycles. We're not a business. And in this model that we saw earlier, the one with the colors, the blueprints, there are many components there that are shared. So maybe we don't operate it ourselves, but it's a, a collaboration between many organizations. And the funding for the people working on it often comes from projects. This does not scream sustainability to me. If we're putting this in that critical path and we're relying on project funding, we need to think again. Also, ongoing coordination, as is often the way in research. Typically, no one's necessarily paid to do the coordination work. Maybe one person takes up the, the challenge for a particular project and sets about organizing the meetings, organizing the admin stuff that needs to happen, but it's not typically anybody's job. The next aspect was a baseline of user experience, and I'll come on to one of these in a bit more depth. There are interoperability barriers. So researchers or indeed organizations will not be able to interoperate because of slight differences in how things are implemented. There are standards, but maybe the standards are flexible to the point of being inoperable, or maybe they're not followed. And trying to coordinate interoperability between a community like Edugain, where there are over 4,000 organizations, is an additional challenge. We thought we were a big community in high energy physics, and turns out, no. Another one is non-legal status. So a research community is typically just a group of organizations who have agreed to operate together, maybe under a memorandum of understanding, but they're not a legal entity in the majority of cases. And so joining a federation might require you to be a legal entity. I'm not sure what the case is here, but in certain countries that is a requirement. So we are already experiencing difficulties in terms of having research communities using identity federation. And user mobility. So I'm thinking about the CERN situation. Maybe there's a scientist on one of the experiments, and maybe she moves university 10 times within her career, but she stays working for the Atlas experiments. 
So the ability to map between those different identities from the different home organisations is pretty critical just to enable her to continue to do her job. Security incident response readiness. I'm going to come back to that one again. The harmonisation of proxy operations and practices. So proxy in this context meant that central blob in the architectural diagram, the, the funnel between the authentication, the authorization, and the services where people are, are heading to. We'd like to be able to re reuse generic services and to follow the best practices for interoperability. And then one particular case down here, which has not come out of the high energy physics community, but has come out of life sciences, where people are dealing with sensitive data. Being able to have a very high level of assurance of who the person is accessing that data is critical to them. It's not just a matter of they want to do it because it's the right thing to do, but no, they have um, law enforcement behind it saying, okay, you need to make sure that these people are who they say they are. So I said we'd take a deep dive into just two of them. Security. So although Edugain and Identity Federations bring many advantages, users can authenticate to other services without the need to have their, a specific username and password for that service, which in a way is an advantage. It's also a disadvantage because for this malicious attacker that we see on the, on the right here, all that person needs is one account and then they could access a vast number of services so it's a different attack vector, it's a different way of thinking. And unfortunately, was not necessarily considered from the beginning. So this is the specification for the metadata. So the metadata is the information that each organization in a federation will publish about themselves. And included in that is some contacts. And sadly for security, the only contact types that were included from the beginning were technical, support, administrative, and billing. So there was not really this thought from the specification point of view about, okay, what happens if there's a security incident? None of those contacts are the correct one to be contacting. We need somebody with some security knowledge at the other side of it who maybe we would want to be collaborating with to gather more forensic information or to follow up with the user, but in a, in a way that's in line with best practices and security. And so people have been working over the last five years to try and inject a level of security into identity federations. We're getting there, which is good, I think. And in addition, particularly for CERN, we've also, because we're used to working with these certificate authorities who have been following policies by the IGTF that we saw earlier, those security policies were very strict. We're used to a certain level of security from the identity providers that we're interacting with. And so for us, being able to know that every user who accesses our infrastructure is covered by a security incident response in their home organization is crucial. A second one, attribute release. It seems kind of obvious, and it's a, the more you think about it, the more ridiculous this problem seems. So we have an identity provider who is sending an identity assertion to a research service. And really, all research services want is some kind of persistent ID, that would be great, a name, and an email. We're not asking for marital status, we're not asking for birthday. It's not sensitive data. You effectively get this when you send an email. This is more or less public information, especially in research when people want their names and email addresses to be published on all of the papers that they put out there. And still we're having this problem. In a way I'm glad, because home organizations are not just sending personal data about their researchers out to the world. It's good that people are hesitant to do it. But at the same time, having a level of pragmatism and adopting frameworks and policies that allows this to happen is a, is a real hurdle, because having an identity arrive at your research infrastructure with none of these is absolutely no use to anybody, unfortunately. 
So the recommendations, we just went through the overview and then a couple of deep dives. And we had nine stakeholder groups that we were trying to address with this paper. So the network coordinators and operators, so in Géant for the rest of Europe, Internet2 in the US, research funding bodies, RefEDs we mentioned just now, the home organizations, the national federations, EDUGAIN to do the link between the national federations, and then moving on to the research stakeholders. So we didn't just make requests and recommendations to other people, we also made them on ourselves to hold ourselves responsible and accountable for actually making some changes to improve the state of affairs for research overall. So the generic infrastructures that we're using, research community proxies, so this model we looked at just now, and then the research communities who use them. And between all of these groups, collaboration is critical. And in the majority of cases, people are talking in the right forums and about the right topics, but there's still room for improvement and the need to identify specific areas where we need to become more interoperable, either through technology or policy. And my last section is the future. And I'm hoping we'll still have time for questions at the end. Great. So trends. There are trends going on in research communities and their use of infrastructure. And the particular ones that I've begun to see more and more of over the past few years We'll start at this end of the arrow. So diverse compute resources. We're no longer in this model of having the data centers from around the world who are part of the research sector providing the computing power. People are looking to other places. So maybe using supercomputers as part of their compute pool, maybe using commercial clouds. There's a diversification in that way. There's an increased focus on data protection, largely due to GDPR. And accompanying that, there's an increased focus on operational security because, of course, that's part of making sure that you're protecting somebody's personal data correctly is having an appropriate level of security at your organization. New protocols. So we mentioned OpenID Connect, what you use when you authenticate with Google or Facebook or whatever it might be. Research community AAIs, so AAI, Authentication Authorization Infrastructure. I apologize, there are a lot of acronyms in this talk. I tried to cut them out, but I still keep saying them. And then infrastructure AI, AAIs. So effectively, any, any digital infrastructure who has a number of services and wants to allow access to a very varying pool of users has or will implement one of these uh, blueprint architectures that we saw before, just because it makes sense, it's a way that's proven to work. And the result of it is that we have both research communities and infrastructures doing more or less the same thing. So what does this mean for research infrastructures? I want to give you an example. This is coming from the life science community. So effectively, they had about 15 smaller communities within life science who had each implemented their own infrastructure for authentication and authorization to varying degrees of success. And this is because it's actually quite difficult. I and mean, you probably got that impression from the, the slide we saw with the diagram. It's complicated. There is a lot of overhead here. It's not just technical, but it's also the policy side. There is some level of administration of checking whether somebody should really be entitled to access a particular resource. That overhead is significant, and it means that these life sciences communities decided that instead of doing it each mini community by themselves, they wanted to collaborate and do one for the entire life science community. Which led to this. So I'll give you a moment to digest. This is a, a fairly horrendous diagram, actually, the more I look at it. But this was what they came up with. This is what they needed to do to be able to provide an authentication and authorization infrastructure for the different life science communities to be able to access the services that they already have. So just to point out a few things, um, different authentication options at the top, some authorization aspects in the middle. They had one proxy component here for SAML services, 
one proxy component here for OpenID Connect services. So we're seeing these new protocols coming into play. And then down here, we have two additional parts, which is effectively because under the hood, they wanted to integrate two different infrastructures, generic infrastructures, I mean. So this is EGI and EUDAP. So maybe to make this clearer, this is effectively what they're talking about. So they have five of these architectures being stacked on top of each other just to be able to provide access for their users to all of the different services that they need. And what this means is that interoperability is crucial. So if there is a scheme for authorization from one of these proxies that is not interoperable with the other, then it's going to fall down. The amount of overhead is not going to be worth the investment. So work on interoperability of standards of technology is crucial. Another aspect that is maybe overlooked is the policy aspect, particularly now that we have data protection taking an increasingly important uh, part in our, our digital lives. But can you imagine from a researcher's point of view, if they need to click an acceptable use policy at all of the different interaction points in here, or if they need to view effectively one privacy notice per service. That, to my mind, is not user-friendliness, and I believe it's not legal, because of course people do not have the physical time to read these things that would just be clicked through. And so making sure that the policies are interoperable as well, so that by clicking once, we know that the user has really read something, and that internally we are processing the data in a way that's consistent with that policy is, to my mind, one of the, the crucial parts of this. So effectively what this has meant is that we've added down here at the bottom, as one of the connected services, another proxy. So in the future, this is probably how things are going to look. There will be these proxy architectures stacked on top of each other with an interoperable policy set, with an interoperable technology stack to allow researchers to do their work. So the FIM for our recommendations goes some way to defining this path towards an interoperable future, and that's the benefit of it. So if you're in here as a research community and you're experiencing challenges, uh, speak up, tell your tell your federation and come and maybe join the FIM for our community. It would be great to have more participation. But what can you do? I have one more question. Right. So A, what can you do? Read the FIM for our paper. B, share the paper with others. C, think of the researchers at the end of this. Or D, nothing. That's, I appreciate it's lunchtime, so you're probably all wanting to run out of the door. A, read the paper. Share with others. Think of the researchers. Or nothing. And anything you could do would be great. Just keeping in mind that at the end of this, it's the scientists who shouldn't have to think about this stuff, but they're blocked because of interoperable, um, lack of interoperable policies and technologies at the end of this. And this is a nice quote that I just want to leave you with, that every researcher is entitled to focus on their work and not be impeded by needless obstacles nor required to understand anything about the federated identity management infrastructure enabling their access to research services. So that's what we're aiming for. And in order to get there, the key is collaboration. If you'd like to find out more about FIMFORA, join us or just find more information, fimfora.org, and take a look. So I've now come to the end. Thank you very much for your attention and participation in the questions.